Good. Okay, well, thanks everybody for being here and joining us, both in person and online. Uh, this is the second installment of my lecture series here. The uh, first lecture I did was mainly giving a, an overview of naturopathic oncology and uh, the training that's involved uh, with that specialty and some of the different approaches that we utilize, uh, how they're both different and how they can complement uh, traditional and conventional therapies. And then we also did kind of briefly go over some of the common therapies that we utilize. And tonight, uh, tonight's lecture will be looking at specifically one of our one of our best treatments uh, in integrative oncology, uh, which is IV vitamin C, and which is kind of one of the real cornerstones by which uh, the Reardon Clinic has, has developed all of its protocols. Uh, Reardon Clinic has been involved uh, in a lot of research that's been done on IV vitamin C, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, you know, how, how they were, how Re Dr. Reardon and, and Dr. Ron and everybody that's uh, followed after has been crucial in um, getting us to where we're at uh, currently with IV vitamin C therapy and, and using it as an adjunctive cancer therapy. So our objectives tonight will be to uh, define IV vitamin C and talk about why it's, you know, why we use it, uh, what's, the, um, what's the scientific basis for it. Uh, we'll be looking at the uh, some of the history and some of the key uh, uh, proponents along the way that uh, drove the, mo the momentum and the research for uh, learning more about how to util utilize IVC in cancer. And we'll discuss some of the uh, clinical indications and uh, the protocols that we use at, at the Reardon Clinic. And uh, along the way, I'll kind of sprinkle in some of my clinical experience that I've that I've had in uh, using IV vitamin C in my patients. And then of course we'll have time for some questions at the end. So vitamin C, what makes vitamin C so special, right? It's um, one of the most interesting things about vitamin C is that it's, it's produced by just about all animals except humans internally. Yeah, humans, some primates, and guinea pigs are the only animals that don't make their own vitamin C. Most animals are able to uh, synthesize vitamin C from sugar, glucose. If you look at the chemical diagram at the bottom there, that is, <clears throat> that is vitamin C, or that's dihydroascorbate, which is the oxidized form of vitamin C, which is what a lot of the vitamin C turns into in your body when you ingest it or put it in the bloodstream. Uh, if you were to mirror that against the chemical structure of glucose, you would realize that it's about one double bond and one hydrogen away from being identical. So it doesn't take much. It's pretty much one simple enzymatic process that can convert uh, glucose, which is readily abundant in the bloodstream of most animals and even humans, uh, uh, and, and you can convert that into vitamin C. And you know, it's long been known that animals in a state of illness, a state of sickness, a state of stress, their internal production of vitamin C goes way up. And we're talking, uh, some animals are able to produce upwards of the equivalent of 100,000 milligrams of vitamin C in one day, especially if they're in a, a pretty severe sick state. So with this knowledge, um, some of the pioneers like Linus Pauling, uh, Hoffer, Cameron, some of the, the early proponents for vitamin C, they, they knew this and they said, well, maybe there's more to vitamin C. Maybe it's not just this innocuous vitamin or nutrient that if you don't have enough of it, you get scurvy, but you really just need about a minuscule amount to prevent that and not much more. So that kind of fueled their interest and, and you know, hey, maybe we do need to be looking at this vitamin C mo molecule as, as a medicine, as a therapy. Um, this is kind of where the orthomolecular 
movement kind of grew out of with, you know, experimenting with higher doses of vitamins and nutrients and it wasn't just about vitamin C, but uh, Dr. You know, Linus Pauling was a huge, you know, uh, he kind of the founder of orthomolecular medicine. And so, so knowing that, that kind of set the stage for them to do their research and we'll pick that up on the next slide. But if you look at uh, vitamin C deficiency, which we know is, you know, basically the, the, the underlying problem with a disease called scurvy, which is, you know, we've known about for hundreds of years, going back to, um, you know, times when, when uh, you know, full navies and, and sailing uh, 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 countries would, would come down with, with this, this illness and this disease before we realized that if they ingested citrus fruits, they could, you know, ward it off pretty easily. And literally a lot of, you know, battles and, and wars were won due to the other side coming down with scurvy. And so, you know, uh, just some lime juice, you know, it was, it was a key, key factor in some wars going one way or the other. But what we know is that at the root, at the cellular level of scurvy or vitamin C deficient tissue is that we're dealing with oxidative stress, okay? And this is, oxidative stress is not unique to scurvy. It's actually the underpinning of essentially all chronic disease. Oxidative stress leads to inflammation, leads to hypoxia, necrosis, and, and this is how you have chronic disease states in different tissue types, and, and cancer as well. So what combats oxidative stress? Nothing really does it better than vitamin C. Vitamin C is the ultimate antitoxin and antidote to oxidative stress because of its unique ability to provide both antioxidant and pro-oxidant effects. And this is done through something, again, we're not gonna get way too scientific or nerdy, but uh, the redox cycle. And this is, redox cycling, redox medicine is basically all about what's going on inside your cells, what's going on inside the mitochondria. This is how life works, is redox. Reduction and oxidation. And it's a balance. And when you've got too much of one side or the other, this is where you start getting things like oxidative stress. Vitamin C is unique in that it can both donate and accept electrons in all tissue types at all times. So if you have enough vitamin C around, it can help to balance this redox cycle. And it works like a water wheel. You have a few other players in it, like oxygen, and um, you need some type of metal like iron or copper. And just simple electron, uh, electrons getting donated back and forth balances out a lot of the stress. So OK, so that's, that's nice to know. Um, this is kind of the reason why people like Linus Pauling and other orthomolecular doctors uh, got interested in vitamin C. Um, but for a long time, we were just, they were just recommending to do it or, you know, by oral intake. And it wasn't until many years later that we, through a lot of research that Dr. Reardon did and, and uh, Dr. Levine at NIH, that we realized that you, you can't get high enough concentrations in the blood through oral intake, at least high enough concentrations where you can kill tumor cells. So oral consumption, even if you push the maximum dose, if you're taking you know, 10,000 to 20,000 milligrams a day, you're not gonna get much higher than about 250 micromolar, which is, that UM is micromolar. If you go intravenously, you can get to a much higher dose, which we're talking now in terms of millimolar. And that difference between micromolar and millimolar is 1,000. So 1,000 mic uh, micromoles in one millimolar. So you can, you can kind of appreciate the, how big of a difference that is in the blood. Um, and through Dr. Reardon's uh, research, which we'll talk about as well, the RECNAC study, uh, he identified that at around 20 millimolar is when you start to see this preferential cytotoxic effect that vitamin C can kill just about every type of cancer cell 
that you expose to it. Again, this was in, in test tubes and that's, that's where the research started. So you can see kind of the scientific background for why vitamin C is a unique molecule, why it's really more than a vitamin and why it's essential for staying healthy, fighting off infection, uh, and combating oxidative stress. So I did want to give a little bit of a timeline on the history of IV vitamin C. Uh, obviously vitamin C was, you know, was around and known about prior to the 1940s, but I wanted to pick it up there because this is when we meet a very kind of interesting fellow named Frederick Klenner, who's kind of thought of as the god, or not the godfather, the grandfather of, uh, of IV vitamin C. He was kind of the first one to start using it intravenously in higher doses. Other people were using it, uh, you know, via injections and, and having decent results with treating viral and bacterial infections. Uh, but along the same lines at this time, we had the rise of a lot of vaccines. A lot of vaccines were being developed. And so uh, a lot of what Dr. Klenner was doing and, and publishing as far as having success with treating things like measles and mumps and tetanus and polio, the focus kind of was taken away from that when all these, you know, the, the whole medical community got behind the vaccines and, uh, and antibiotics as well. And so the, the vitamin C therapy kind of got lost in the shuffle there. But then we had a, you know, uh, a two-time Nobel Prize winner, Linus Pauling, who was a chemist by trade, kind of picked up where Klenner left off. And he started uh, using IV vitamin C in higher doses than Klenner was, and he was using it in cancer patients and having good results and uh, publishing case studies and he was collaborating with um, a British cancer surgeon by the name of Cameron and also with Abram Hoffer and some of the big players in orthomolecular medicine at that time. And he was, he kept putting out re research and, and, and uh, compelling data and, and urging the medical community to come on board and do larger scale studies and kept getting uh, rebuffed and kind of um, you know shunned for it but finally Mayo Clinic uh, agreed to do a clinical trial. There's a Dr. Uh, Mertel that headed up the the Mayo Clinic team that looked at they said okay we're gonna you know once and for all, we're going to find out if vitamin C is all that these people are, you know, making it out to be in this, this potential treatment for cancer. So they enrolled patients and started giving them 10 grams of vitamin C a day. And uh, after about two and a half months, they stopped the trial and said patients aren't having any benefit from it. So Dr. D or Linus Pauling and all the proponents said, well, wait, wait a minute. And, and once the paper actually was published by Mayo Clinic, it was quickly realized that they weren't giving it intravenously, they were giving it orally. And of course, Linus Pauling uh, wrote several rebuttals uh, pointing this error out and it was met with, you know, again, he was, he was rebuffed and, and shunned and, and unfortunately this was kind of towards the end of Linus Pauling's life and, and you know the brilliant Nobel Prize winner that he was, uh, all of that kind of went by the wayside and he kind of ended his life and the whole medical community kind of thought of him as a, as a quack. <laughs> so it was kind of an unfortunate ending for, for Linus Pauling. He, he continued to do research on IV vitamin C even after the Mayo Clinic um, debacle. but. Um, you know, it was just unfortunate that he never really saw the fruits of a lot of his, a lot of his work. But the torch was carried and um, eventually a couple of fellows, Mark Levine and Dr. Hugh Reardon, who is the namesake of our clinic, uh, picked up the torch and knowing that uh, the Mayo Clinic had, had made errors with their, with, with their trial and their uh, results, uh, went back and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna start again at square one, we need to, establish that oral vitamin C 
it can, you cannot reach the plasma levels needed to kill cancer cells with oral dosing. So that was some of the first stuff that they published. Mark Levine was out of the NIH and, and obviously had a lot of um, grants and funding through that. Dr. Reardon had a lot of funding through a, a private benefactor. Uh, and so that's kind of how all that work got, got started and funded. Um, and so these were, you know, these two guys were crucial in kind of bridging the gap between what Linus Pauling had discovered and, you know, those of us that are doing IV vitamin C today obviously owe a lot to Dr. Reardon, Dr. Levine. Dr. Levine's still at the NIH. She's still, still writing about IV vitamin C and, and, and other um, integrative therapies. Uh, they, I think he just recently put out a paper this year, uh, kind of a systematic review, if you will, uh, for IV vitamin C trials. Uh, Dr. Reardon, his, his project in collaboration with Levine was uh, a project called the RECNAC study. And the RECNAC is cancer backwards. And he began, you know, he began in test tubes and looking at, you know, how high do we need to get the vitamin C levels in order to have the cytotoxic effect on cancer cells. And he was looking at, you know, I think he looked at over 20 different tumor cell lines and all of them once we reached that magic kind of 20 millimolar concentration, it would, the, the vitamin C would kill the cancer cells. And so he went on uh, and uh, developed pretty much the, the modern day protocol for IV vitamin C, which is still used by you know, all of the, the large institutions that are, are studying vitamin C now, both in the United States and overseas. Um, and um, Again, just just huge, uh, a huge amount of uh, gratitude to those guys for carrying the torch and and really setting a, us up for some of the exciting things that are happening uh, right now with IV vitamin C research and and of course all the patients that have benefited from it along the way. Okay, so. I didn't want to get too kind of geeked out with the, the what's going on on a biochemical level with, with IV vitamin C, but this was from a recent uh, review paper, and I just thought this one kind of image really brought a lot of the information together in a more digestible form that we could, that I could kind of hit the highlights on. So these are, these, you know, the four boxes on the right are kind of the main ways in which we now know vitamin C impacts cancer. Uh, so, the top two, you know, have to do with the redox cycling, which we talked about a little bit earlier. And um, you can see at the top on, on the right that we're, we're producing hydrogen peroxide, which is um, a radical that can get into cancer cells. And because cancer cells lack an enzyme called catalase, which was something that they discovered back, you know, in Linus Pauling's uh, uh, research. They can't, they can't break down the, the peroxide. And so it causes apoptosis and, and, and cell lysis and uh, cell damage to the cancer cells. Our healthy cells do have catalase, thankfully. So we can process the, the peroxide without it causing any damage in our healthy cells. Um, by the same mechanism of redox, we get also the dihydroascorbate, the DHA there. And this is the oxidized form once the once the uh, once vitamin C has donated an electron, it, it becomes uh, dihydroascorbate, and this is the molecule that looks very similar to sugar. And cancer cells have a ton of sugar receptors, <laughs> or glutes, you know, glucose transporters on their surface. And this is one of the reasons why they give you a PET scan, or why a PET scan works, because PET scan actually you're getting radioactive sugar. They tag the dye that they give you with radioactive sugar and they watch for where it lights up because those are the cancer cells that are taking in the sugar much quicker than our healthy cells, okay? So the dihydroascorbate um, vitamin C form gets taken up through those into the cancer cells at a much higher rate than our healthy cells and again causes, causes oxidative damage and, and, and causes the cells to, to die. 
the, the bottom two uh, mechanisms are uh, newer discoveries, uh, the uh, very exciting discoveries that have come from uh, colleagues in, in Japan and Europe, um, lots of, of teams of uh, benchside uh, um, researchers that have been working on this type of stuff, but uh, we've uh, uncovered other pathways by which IV vitamin C might be beneficial for cancer patients. One of the real exciting ones is that, that, that third one that talks about the epigenetic effect and where we can actually reverse some of these cancer stem cells, which is where we oftentimes run into a lot of problems with resistance. You've probably heard of chemotherapy resistance or you know patients will go and they'll get chemo or radiation or other conventional treatments for their cancer and um, it'll be effective for some time and then at some point it stops being effective. That's because the cells become resistant. And that's largely due to the stem cell phenotypes. The stem cells that are still there, are, um, they're almost, uh, they're al they, they've, they've reverted back to uh, uh, kind of primordial cells, if you will. Most of our, this, well, all of our cells in our body, the healthy cells are eukaryotic and uh, can do both fermentation and oxidative phosphorylation, whereas cancer stem cells revert back almost into a, a prokaryotic state, and all they can do is, um, for energy, is, is, is fermentation. And so it makes them highly resistant, but IV vitamin C and ascorbic acid in the blood at certain levels changes the methylation, which is how you turn on and off genes. Methylation is all about turning on and off the expression of different genes. And this is where this phenomenon of epigenetics. A lot of times you hear epigenetics discussed these days with diet and lifestyle and uh, all these different things, uh, how you can clean your genes and um, actually affect the expression of your genes. Well, IV vitamin C does that as well. And in, and in very specific ways that help with cancer stem cells. So that's very exciting. And then that last uh, section there about the HIF, uh, that's hypoxia inducible factor. This is a major driver of some types of cancer like kidney cancer and lung cancer. Um, and IV vitamin C has been shown to upregulate the upstream enzymes that turn off the hypoxia inducible factor. And so you get decreased hypoxic stress, decreased oxidative stress, again, going back to the oxidative stress being the issue. And so some, some, some other ways in which, um, in which IV vitamin C can help, not just the hydrogen peroxide generation. And uh, so you can see that, that vitamin C really is sort of a, a Swiss army knife and, and has lots of benefits. And this is what makes it just a great adjunctive therapy for cancer patients. It's well tolerated, doesn't harm the healthy cells, and it has many mechanisms by which it um, kills cancer cells, stops cancer cell growth, and even reverses the underlying genetic issues with cancer cells. So understanding what's going on at the cellular level is nice, but of course, in modern day medicine, we need human research in order to take it to the mainstream and, and get it approved and, and get access to patients that need this. So I wanted to give kind of an overview of where we're at with our research efforts in IV vitamin C. There's hundreds of, of preclinical studies um, that, again, started way back with Linus Pauling and Frederick Klenner all the way up till now. And preclinical studies, these are you know, studies that are in test tubes or animals. And um, with these types of studies, we're mainly looking for how does it work, what's the mechanism, uh, which types of tumor cell lines or different targets on their surface are we, are, uh, is it effective against? Uh, and then safety and synergy with other agents as well can be, can be identified through preclinical studies. So we're well past that. Um, We've got lots of case studies as well, which is kind of the lowest form of human research. Um, these are just, you know, usually one-off uh, case reports that are written up usually retrospectively. Sometimes you'll get a case series of several patients. Um, but these, again, are more hypothesis-generating type studies. 
Uh, and we have a, a decent amount of these showing overall good benefit in all, ac across all tumor types, uh, improved survival, improved quality of life. Uh, then we move into more clinical trials, which, you know, we have phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. Phase one studies, these are usually low, you know, low accrual, you know, usually there's, you know, maybe a maximum of 20 or 30 patients in these. Uh, looking at safety and tolerability, we're looking at how high can we get the dose before it starts causing adverse effects. We're looking at pharmacokinetics as far as how long is it active in the system. Um, how is it metabolized, how is it excreted, uh, those types of things. And then also in phase one studies, uh, we're looking at, or we have ones that where we've combined it with chemo and radiation and looking at does this block the effects of the chemo radiation, does it enhance the effects of the chemo radiation. But in phase one studies, the endpoints are not designed to look at response, okay? So the main endpoints for phase one studies is just looking at the safety and these other factors. So phase one studies, when, when, when you present those, people say, okay, it's safe, it's tolerated, we know how it works in the body, but it doesn't really, it's not a practice changing, um, type, it's not practice changing type information, it's just a start. But if we have good positive phase one studies, then they'll move into phase two and phase three studies, and that's kind of where we're at. We have a number of positive phase one studies. The next uh, few slides, I have a few selected studies that we'll look at that have been kind of landmark studies. Um, but the phase two and phase three studies, this is where we get kind of the momentum. This is where we get, uh, uh, you know, the, large institutions involved and we're looking at large sample sizes of patients, specific diseases, we're randomizing them where we have groups of patients that are getting say standard treatment and then they're compared against a similar cohort of patients that get that same treatment plus the IV vitamin C and we see who does better. And so this gives us a, a higher level of data to go off of. And these are, you know, the FDA requires phase two and phase three studies in order to get approval for, for you know, any type of therapy or drug. So there's phase two studies. There's a lot of phase two studies underway. Uh, to my knowledge, there are not any current or previous phase three studies, but I think that those are on the horizon. Uh, a lot of the momentum with IV vitamin C is not in cancer right now. It's actually in um, conditions like sepsis and acute respiratory distress. Uh, Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, these major institutions there, they're all looking at IV vitamin C in, in these types of conditions, like especially sepsis. There's a lot of momentum around that and a lot of research that's going to be coming out soon um, because of uh, a few doctors on the East Coast that have uh, published some pretty remarkable results as far as um, treating sepsis with IV vitamin C and very safely and very effectively. So uh, I think by way of sometimes with therapies and drugs and medications, uh, sometimes they first get approved for other conditions and then we find out later that they actually work better for something else. Uh, I think IV vitamin C again, it's there's lots of applications for it, even beyond cancer. Um, but I think maybe what gets us through the door with, medi with uh, mainstream medicine and Western medicine doctors is showing that it can help with sepsis. And then it gets more uh, accepted by them. And then from there, it, it's much easier to talk about how it can be utilized in other, other situations and, and other conditions like cancer. So we'll look at a few of the, uh, like I said, kind of choice studies that I selected just to kind of uh, look at. This was a phase one study that was done at uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, which is where I worked at for eight years before uh, joining the Reardon Clinic. And uh, this was, again, a phase one study, so they were just looking at how high can we get the dose, what's optimal dosing, how is it tolerated, what are side effects, that type of stuff. Um, they actually were pretty aggressive with the uh, frequency of their IVs. They did four consecutive days uh, per week. Most protocols call for two to three uh, at a max per week. 
Um, so four consecutive IVs per week was, is a little aggressive, but it was well tolerated. And they were able to get up to 49 millimolar. Uh, they were checking the post IVC blood, uh, blood concentration. It's well tolerated and they had recommended going forward out of that, that a, a future studies look at the dosing between 70 to 80 grams per meter squared. This study, this was a phase two study, one of the few randomized studies that we have, probably the, probably the if, if I'm just trying to make inroads with oncologists or people who are skeptical, uh, other doctors that are skeptical, I usually start with this study because it's, it's a high quality study, it's got good data. Uh, this was um, done, you can see Levine's name on there, so the same Mark Levine that we talked about from the NIH. Um, Jeannie Drisco and, and Dr. Chen, who are both out of KU Integrative. Um, so there was a lot of, a lot of great docs on, on this study. And it was looking at ovarian cancer. And they actually, again, it was randomized. So they had a group that was getting standard chemotherapy. And they had a, a, a matched cohort that was doing the same chemotherapy plus IV vitamin C. And their results were, were were pretty fascinating. They found that the group that got the, the IV vitamin C had an 8.75 month increase in progression free survival and a strong trend toward improved overall survival. And chemotherapy side effects were substantially decreased. That type of chemo regimen they were given, carbotaxol, is among one of the highest toxicity profiles of, of chemo regimens out there. So that's that's duly noted as far as the side effects being substantially decreased. Uh, but then when you throw the improved progression-free survival and overall survival in, um, this is a strong study. And this was just, just, was just published in the last couple of years. Another phase one study here, this was looking at um, IV vitamin C and advanced, uh, all types of advanced tumors. Uh, this study was interesting because it was all the, the patients in it were patients that had failed all the available conventional treatments and then a lot of them were elderly patients and um, they uh, found that it was well tolerated even in these late stage patients and that uh, two of the patients actually had a, a really, uh, I believe it was, I believe it was like a two year their disease didn't go away, but they had stable disease, and it was very unexpected for their condition, their tumor type. So again, more kind of um, good results to see, gaining momentum. This was another recent study as well. I also wanted to highlight some of the upcoming and active trials, because I think this kind of, again, shows more of the, you know, the momentum and, and the interest around the world, not just in the US. Uh, lots of phase two and phase two, uh, phase one and phase two studies uh, planned. Uh, if you go to the, if you use the NCT number that I uh, uh, put after all of them, you can put that number in on the clinicaltrials.gov website and it'll bring up all the information for the trial, where they're doing it, who are the researchers, what's the criteria, and you know, how many patients they've enrolled. It, it gives you a lot of information. So. Clinicaltrials.gov is, is, is a nice website to look at if you're trying to find what's on the rise. Uh, but you can see lots of different tumor types. Um, and we do have two of them are randomized. So again, randomized data is much higher level data and stuff that, you know, mainstream medicine can't ignore. So you know, with all that said, um, I really believe that the indications for IV vitamin C in cancer patients are pretty much across the board. Um, you can always make a case, given its safety, its tolerability, its ability to show uh, anti-tumor effects across pretty much all different cell lines, and its, its synergy with a lot of the conventional treatments, you know, whether you're a patient that failed standard treatment, a patient that is looking to improve the effectiveness or decrease the side effects of, of standard treatment, 
if you're a patient that's in remission and looking to stay there, uh, IV vitamin C, and, and then of course some patients, you know, forgo standard treatment altogether, and I think that obviously IV vitamin C is one of the best things we can do for them uh, when they're not getting any other types of treatments. I do think that IV, IV vitamin C alone, for the most part, is not enough for cancer. I, I would never prescribe it as a monotherapy. I, there's lots of other things that at the Reardon Clinic we combine it with, uh, other nutritional protocols. So we, we're always looking to balance out nutrition in the body and any deficiencies, but there's other integrative therapies. Uh, one of the other therapies I use a lot of, which is what my next lecture will be uh, kind of diving into, is mistletoe therapy. And so um, with a lot of these integrative therapies, they're, they're powerful, they're um, very effective, but with cancer, you need as many things on board as you can, and you gotta hit it from a lot of different angles. So um, that lecture, for those of you wondering, will be, uh, will be next month uh, here at the same place. And I also did write a recent uh, article in our newsletter, which is called Health Hunters. You can get it on the reardonclinic.org website. And it gives a kind of a brief flavor for mistletoe therapy and, and kind of set the stage for my next lecture. So I'll wrap up by talking about the protocols that we use for IV vitamin C at the Reardon Clinic. Um, again, this is based off of Dr. Hugh Reardon's original research, the RECNAC study, and this is the basis for IV vitamin C protocols that are used all around the world. So the Reardon Clinic has really set the stage for that. Uh, we, when we bring patients in, we first obviously obtain baseline screening labs. We're looking at kidney function, we're looking at the complete blood count, the urine. Most importantly, we're looking at to make sure they don't have low levels of G6PD, which is a, a glucose 6 um, phosphate dehydrogenase. This is something that's involved in uh, the red blood cell cycle, and if patients are low in it, they can have premature uh, red blood cell uh, destruction. And if you're giving patients high doses of IV vitamin C and they have that condition, uh, it can be life-threatening. So that's something you have to rule out. Uh, it's quite rare. It's a little more common in males than females, but we don't pick up that many cases of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite rare to see it clinically. Um, the first dose we start with is usually about a 15 to 25 gram dose of, of IV vitamin C, uh, given in normal saline or lactated ringer we usually add magnesium to it, and sometimes we'll add some other nutrients in with it, but that's kind of the base cocktail. And then we're doing this sort of hormesis-like um, titration where we're, you know, we don't give them 100 grams right out of the gate, but we're building up their body's sort of tolerance to this. And after 50 grams, 75 grams, 100 grams, we're checking their plasma levels to make sure that they're achieving this cytotoxic effect level, which is that about 20 millimolars or 350 to 400 milligrams per deciliter. Yeah, for reference, if you aren't getting vitamin C and aren't taking mega doses of oral vitamin C, if we checked your plasma level right now, most people's would be about one milligram per deciliter. So that's how much we're increasing it with IV. Uh, we usually do about two to three a week, two to three IVs. Um, they can last anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours, depending on uh, you know what else we got in there and how slow or fast we're able to run the rate. Some patients do better with a slower rate. You know there can be IV associated um, side effects, but those are few and far between. Uh, if they are. Uh, some patients get some irritation with the IV, and we can add in things like bicarb to kind of uh, lessen that effect. Uh, the biggest thing we see is patients getting, um, you know, dizzy, lightheaded, and that's usually due to the fact that they didn't eat before they got their IV, or they're not well hydrated. So you can offset a lot of the side effects by um, by doing those things. Um, but most people feel great after the IV; their energy's good. You know, patients will go and start exercising right after their IVs. We do recommend that patients take oral IV or oral 
vitamin C in between their IVs to help keep that saturation level up because the problem with the high dose is about within about two to three hours it's completely excreted from the system. Uh, so how do we get these extended effects? This is where uh, Dr. Ron and some of the other um, uh, some of the other masterminds uh, are working on this continuous low dose infusion, uh, which is still in development. But uh, I think I think this is going to be something that's going to be a game changer. Uh, this is where patients, whether they're receiving the high dose bolus treatments or not, uh, they can be kind of hooked up to a pump that it, it doesn't require any hardware or elect electrical parts. It's, it's just a gravity pump and. Um, they can walk around for 24, 40, 72 hours and get a continuous drip, basically, of lower doses of vitamin C. And this goes back to some of the, um, this is more in line with some of the original research that uh, Linus Pauling was doing, um, where he was giving more continuous low doses. Uh, and so I think that there's a place for both of these and maybe ideally the places that we use both of them in tandem, where patients are getting two IVs a week, but in between that they're wearing the pump and getting the continuous infusion. So that's on the horizon and um, that's you know something that the Reardon Clinic is, is kind of exclusively developing, so keep your eyes peeled for that. So that's uh, the end of the presentation and uh, I think we have about 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that there was also a B complex when you get the vitamin C. We, we do put that in, so, in some of the IVs. Uh, it's not part of the standard uh, cocktail. Usually it's just IV vitamin C and the magnesium, but we can easily add in B complex. And I do that for a lot of my patients if, um, if it's indicated. Are you also on the radio? I mean, on the uh, you call in, uh, you're on the computer, and you can call in. You have a discussion like that. The doctor call time? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's um, there's. If you go to the website, you can see when the different. There's four of us that do it, and we're at different days, different times. But um, yeah, it's a 30 minute uh, call time that we do every week. So there's four opportunities to get in on those calls, and um, we a answer general questions. Uh, for patients that are um, looking to come to our clinic, and um, so four days a week. Uh, right now, it's three days a week. One of the days we have two different slots. Um, so, but the information on the website, there's most of them are in the evening, but we have one in the morning, and we might be doing one at lunchtime as well, so that we can kind of offer um, different times throughout the day for patients to be able to access it. We have a question through YouTube asking about adding bubbled ozone therapy with vitamin C. Bubbled ozone therapy. Mm -hmm. I don't know about the bubbled part, but we oftentimes will do ozone therapy, um, not not at the same time as the IV vitamin C, but um, those are compatible type treatments. Ozone is another big player in that redox cycle, right, and, and the oxygenation part of that. And so uh, ozone has lots of clinical applications, uh, and we use it uh, for chronic infections, chronic diseases, but there's a lot of applications for cancer patients too, and sometimes we will combine that, not in the same IV bag, but we'll, we'll kind of do those types of treatments in tandem with cancer patients. Another question is, if they wanted to be able to share the protocol with their uh, doctor, how do they know the correct protocol? Uh, well, it's, it's published on our website. Uh, it's on ReardonClinic.org. Uh, Reardon Clinic is, you know, we're very transparent with what we do and all the information's on there. If you, I think if you go to the tab that says what, what, what we do, under there there's an IV vitamin C link and just a wealth of information there and uh, the protocol is outlined there as well and so you could just share that with them or, um, or uh, my, my presentation, I'm sure, will be available as well. The follow-up question to the ozone. It says, isn't one an antioxidant and the other an antioxidant? Yes and no. Well, we talked about it on the 
one of the first few slides where IV vitamin or vitamin C has this ability to have an antioxidant effects at the same time as prooxidant effects. And so the, peroc the hydrogen peroxide generation of IV vitamin C is having an oxidative effect, whereas the, uh, some of the other effects that we looked at are more from an antioxidant perspective. You need a balance. It's not all about oxidation or antioxidation. That's what the redox cycle is all about. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concert, it's, it's a balance of electron transfer. And so if you have too much antioxidants or too much oxidation, you can get into trouble either way. And that's why IV vitamin C is such a neat molecule is that it's, it can literally balance out either side of that. Why is the saturation important? Why is it a higher number better than 354? Yeah, so you know we talked about how um, Dr. Reardon through his RECNAC study, he was, he was looking at uh, in test tubes how high do we need to get this plasma concentration to where we actually start seeing the cancer cells dying. And so he was slowly ramping up the doses and lo and behold that 20 millimolar concentration is when he started visualizing literally the cancer cells dying when exposed to that high a dose in, in, the, in, the, in the environment. And so some, some of those phase one studies have tried to push the dose. One of the ones that I highlighted, they were getting up to 50 millimolar. Um, and uh, from my understanding, the higher doses have not shown uh, to be that much better and you're also exposing patients to uh, a little bit more risk when you go higher doses like that there are a little bit there are some more adverse effects that can take place at higher doses like going up to 150 grams 200 grams even though some patients can tolerate that the best toler tolerance and kind of the, the the window where you get the best therapeutic effect and the best tolerance is that 20 to 30 millimolar concentration. So that's kind of the basis for that. But I don't think the discussion's over, and I think some of the future studies that we have might better uh, inform us as to maybe in certain tumor types we do want higher doses, or in certain stages, whether it's you know, whether it's a patient that's in remission or a patient that is, does have an active cancer, maybe that changes how high a dose we go. Uh, but right now, we see good results with trying to dial in the post-IVC treatment to that 350 to 400 range. How does the vitamin C leave your body? It's excreted mainly through the kidneys, which is why we need to check kidney function very often to make sure that you know, patients, you know, one of the contraindications is chronic kidney disease or, you know, other conditions that can cause fluid overload, um, but it's mainly excreted through the kidneys. It's not urine. Huh? It's not urine. Then. Yes, the urine is from the kidney, yeah. So the kidneys excrete it into the urine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's active in the body anywhere from two to three hours, and then eventually it'll get excreted through the, through the kidneys into the urine. Are they looking at something to stabilize that to last longer in the body rather than be excreted so quickly? Not that I know of, but that's the basis for why the continuous low dose infusion that we talked about, the pump, uh, where you can kind of keep this saturation level more steady and higher without just getting a huge bolus and then two, three hours later you're kind of back to square one. Um, so uh, I don't know of any studies that are looking at you know, other treatments or other therapies that will keep the vitamin C in the body longer. One of the things that, that is worth noting is liposomal or lipospheric vitamin C, uh, which is um, vitamin C that you take orally, but it's encapsulated in a little, kind of like an artificial cell, a liposome. This goes directly into the lymphatic system through the gut and uh, the half-life of that is thought to be much longer than both ingested ascorbic acid as well as IV ascorbic acid. So I think liposomal vitamin C orally uh, you know, might be kind of a, another answer to getting 
higher, you know, better saturation for longer periods of time. But you still can't, even with liposomal, you can't reach those 20 millimolar concentrations in the blood. So it's, um, there's more work to be done, but that is one of the drawbacks is, you know, the, 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 the short peak time as far as the concentration of it. But it's doing a lot of damage in those two hours too to the cancer cells. So, but that's another reason why you got to get frequent IVs. You know, you can't do one IV a month and expect it to have any, you know, major major change. So, I was surprised on the website that it said it was nonprofit clinic. The Rudin Clinic is nonprofit. Yes. Uh, as far as I know, yes, yes. Um, uh, also, I was pleased to learn that uh, if your doctor is an MD doctor, that a lot of times you submit those bills to your insurance and they pay a lot of that. that yeah, not, not so much with the therapies, but I think with like lab testing and, and more of the, um, more of like the general medical care that we can provide. Oh, absolutely, every little bit helps, so yeah. We have another question on YouTube, that's a great follow-up to the last one about does that mean that cancer cells don't die on your day off, your off day treatments, because it's out of your system and you're not getting that high of dose that day? That, that's the worry and the concern, and that's why, again, I go back to vitamin C by itself, I don't believe is enough. Uh, this is also why we you know, want patients taking high oral doses in between, but uh, this is why you know, I think we haven't seen you know, these major uh, uh, studies that we've had done, we haven't, you know, we've seen improvement in survival, but we haven't seen this huge overall survival improvement. I think that's because we're just not getting a long enough saturation level with the vitamin C, and, and I think that's why it's, it truly is an adjunctive treatment, and it's, it's one piece of the puzzle. It's a great piece to have on board, and everybody should have it on board, but by itself, I don't think it's enough. Uh, there's been studies done that says uh, ginger oil kills cancer cells and a lot of studies that frankincense and that down the wood kills some do they ever recommend that? Do you do that on the side? I mean, you know, to be honest, you could find a study that everything can kill cancer cells because uh, it's there, there's so much of these preclinical studies that I talked about where we're just looking lots of things kill cancer cells in a test tube. And then you put them in a mouse or you put them in a guinea pig and then you put them in a human and they don't do much. So um, a lot of the studies that we have on natural things like herbs and um, uh, you know essential oils and things like that having anti-cancer effects those are preclinical studies and so it's interesting information but we don't know what it's going to do in a human that's why we need you know clinical trials and that's why we're still kind of behind the eight ball even with IV vitamin C because we need larger scale clinical trials to confirm that what we're seeing is is uh, you know is truly what's happening, and so you know you could make a case. I tell patients, you know, I could I could give you a hundred different supple oral supplements you could start taking today that might have some activity against your your cancer. But you know, at the end of the day, there's only so much we can do. There's only so many things you can take. I think the diet you got to get that right before you start adding in dozens and dozens of supplements. Um, so. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things out there that have anti-cancer potential, but we have to kind of look at what do we have the best research to support and kind of start there. Because they can't hurt you. A lot of those things, that's the beauty. They can't hurt you, and that's why I tell patients, you know, if you have the appetite and, and the, the funds and all that to take all these supplements, I, I, I'm okay with you, as long as they're things that aren't gonna interfere with medications and they're not taking it the wrong way. Um, you know, I never tell patients to not take something because oftentimes with herbs and vitamins, they are safe, you know, even if, even in higher doses, so. What do you consider a high oral dose in between? Uh, I usually try to tell patients around four grams a day, 4,000 milligrams a day, but usually in divided doses, so. Water soluble, fat soluble, or which one would work better? So, uh, I mean, uh, Ascorbic acid is, is water soluble, so you can, you can get powder, you can get capsules, uh, but then there's also the liposomal vitamin C, uh, and that absorbs, you get a much, a much better uh, bioavailability from the liposomal because you're literally absorbing 100% of it, whereas 
Ascorbic acid, uh, you might absorb a total of 25% of it. So um, if you're doing regular ascorbic acid, I'd say four to six grams a day in divided doses. If you're doing the liposomal, I'd say one to two grams a day. But some people believe you should take it up to bowel tolerance because your body, depending on what your body's dealing with with stress and sickness, your need and, and your body's uh, need for vitamin C can go up and down. So some people, if they're sick and they're dealing with a flu or a cold or cancer, they might be able to tolerate, you know, 10 to 20 grams of vitamin C a day before they start getting loose stools. And so there's a kind of a camp and a theory that says, well, oral, oral dosing should just be up to bowel tolerance because that's that determines what your body specifically needs. All right. Well, we'll end it there. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next month for part three.